The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The proceeding will start shortly.
The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The 
The proceeding will start shortly. 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 Order, order. Before we begin, can I remind members that they are expected to wear face coverings when they are not speaking in the debate, and this is in line with current government guidance and that of the House of Commons Commission. I remind members that they are asked by the House to have a COVID lateral flow test before coming onto the estate. Please give each other and members of staff space when you are seated and when you are entering and exiting the room. Mr Nick Fletcher to move the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. Throw lines. In May 2018, Mark Allen was out with his friends on a hot summer's day. He was a bright and funny young man who wanted to be an actor. The water where he and his friends had congregated was welcoming. Like many young men and some girls, they did not register the dangers. Feeling hot and sticky, the clothes came off and in they went. I'm pretty sure if I'd have been there, aged 18, I would have done the same. I have swum in the sea a thousand times, so what's the difference? So in they all went. No doubt they screamed with laughter and pain when the cold hit them and probably splashed, splashed each other in the water like we all do. Apparently, these boys got out but they decided to go back in. Mark, unfortunately, never swam again. I met Mark's mum, Leanne, last week, a brave woman who told me of her story. The pain of losing a child, there can really be nothing quite like it. And my thoughts and prayers go out to all Mark's extended family and friends for their loss. I think when someone dies so young, we have to ask why. It's a very tough question. When a family can take something positive out of such a tragic event, it doesn't remove the pain, but I think at least it may help bring some sense to it by preventing others from going through the same experience. Mm -hmm. Mark's mum made a promise to him that she would do all she can to stop this happening to other people, so families like hers do not have to suffer a similarly tragic event. The petition started by Leanne has reached 103,000 signatures and 57 of my own constituents have signed it. It has huge support and I am pleased to bring this debate here today. I also know that there has been a similar campaign work on throw line stations and water safety education over the years and I would like to recognise the work of those campaigners too. Hundreds of people die each year in water and the statistics prove it is mainly young boys and men. Over the last eight years, the library figures have shown that between 80 and 90% of those who suffer fatalities in natural water are male. So what is happening? Well, it appears that boys and men are less risk averse than girls, so that is the first point that needs addressing. The second point, which I believe to be the most important, is that many of the deaths are not down to poor swimming capabilities. Just because you can swim doesn't make you safe. It's the shock of the cold water that kills so many. It's not like jumping into a swimming pool, which is often heated. It's not like running into the sea and then running back out again until you get used to it. 
It's the jumping in that does it. And the third point to raise is the fact that there are no lifeguards to help anyone in trouble. So what's the answer? Well, this debate is about throw lines. So some people believe that having these all open water spaces could be the answer. And I believe that that would help an awful lot, but it's not completely the answer. The problem is, is that if I saw safety equipment around a stretch of water, it may suggest to me that this is a safe place and I can go in. When I spoke to, spoke to David Walker of the Royal Society for Prevention of Accidents, a professional in this field, he said when he sees this equipment, he's pretty sure that there has been an incident. In other words, what shouts safe to me and many members of the public actually shouts danger to a professional. Having spoken to David, I am convinced there needs to be a three-pronged approach to this. Education must be the first part. A 20-minute session with every child once a year would be a wonderful start. And we must, we really must make sure that boys engage with these lessons. Secondly, mandatory risk assessments of all waters, natural or man-made, must be carried out. ROSPA will help with these, and although many of the larger water companies and councils do already perform them, too many, it appears, are just a paper exercise, and they don't really carry out a thorough assessment or act fully on their findings. This should be addressed. And finally, if equipment is to be put in place, such as throw lines, it must only be done so with sufficient warnings, stating that this equipment is not a signal to say that the water is safe, it is far from it, and no matter how many times you have swum before, it could be your last. We will never stop young people doing risky things, since it's part of growing up. It's fun, and it makes us who we are. We learn from these actions. That was a good thing to do. That was not so good. I'm a believer in taking risks, but I also think those risks must be calculated. If our young people are not fully aware of the dangers, then it's our job to correct this. So now I ask the Minister, will she address these three points? I believe the previous Education Minister was looking into the education element. So will this Minister ask the Education Minister <laughs> to do the same? <laughs> will the Government make risk assessments of all bodies of water mandatory? And lastly, when and if any equipment is installed, will the warning signs be placed everywhere that say, this water is not safe, do not enter? We will never bring Mark back, but we can help Leanne fulfil her promise to her son, and we can at least reduce the number of fatalities, or reduce the number of families who have to go through similar fatalities. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 575967 relating to the throw line stations around open bodies of water. And I must say my experience with the Minister means that she will be able to cover all issues. She normally is competent across many, many issues and departments. I now call Mr Afzal Khan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak in today's debate. And I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for Don Wally for introducing this debate on behalf of the petitioners and for making some good suggestions on uh, how to improve the situation. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Leanne Bartley for being here today and for the tireless work campaigning to improve water safety. I spoke to Leanne ahead of this debate, and I know she made a promise to her son Mark after he died to change things for the better. Today's debate is a testament to her hard work in keeping the promise she made to her beloved son. Mark was a well-known and well-liked in Gorton, where he lived with his dad. He'd taken his GCSEs at Wright Robinson College in my constituency and was studying drama at Sheena Simon College. He had big dreams of becoming a professional actor when we spoke, Leanne shared stories of the joy and laughter Mark brought to a family holiday in Paris. His love of watching wrestling and about Mark's generosity to those that less fortunate than himself. In June 2018, Mark was enjoying the hot weather 
with his friends on the edge of Gorton Lower Reservoir. Wanting to cool off and unaware of the incredible dangers of open water, Mark jumped in. The freezing water took his breath away. His friends were unable to save him, and he tragically died. If a throw line had been available on the shore of the reservoir that day, Mark may have survived. Throw lines are basic equipment. They are essentially a bag containing a rope which can be thrown to a swimmer in distress, allowing the rescuer to safely pull them to shore. Since Mark's death, thanks to campaigning by Leanne and Mark's family and friends, and with the support of the local community in Gorton, I'm pleased the Manchester City Council, Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service, and the reservoir's owner, United Utilities, have installed three throw line stations at Gorton Reservoirs. They are dedicated to Mark's memory. There is no reason throw lines cannot be installed wherever there is a risk of drowning. They are not expensive and they do save lives. They should be as common as defibrillators. And today's petition is absolutely right to call for Mark's law. And I hope the minister will now be able to update us on the progress being made to make open water safer. Thank you, Madam. Thank you so much. I now call Mr. David Jones. Thank you, Ms. Garney. And may I say how pleased I am to see you in the chair today. And my congratulations to my honourable friend on his opening and my gratitude to the Petitions Committee for securing this debate today. Um, it is, as you've heard, founded uh, on a petition initiated by my constituent, uh, Mrs. Leanne Bartley of Rithin, who in fact is present in, in the chamber today. And it was prompted by the tragic death of her son, Mark Allen. As we've heard, on the 5th of June 2018, Mark, who was then aged 18 and was living with his father in Gorton, Manchester, uh, was with a group of friends in Debdale Park, uh, which is one of the largest public open spaces in the city. It was, as we've heard, a hot day, and Mark decided to cool off by swimming in the nearby Debdale Reservoir, which is a large body of water managed by United Utilities. It would appear that he scaled a fence to climb up to a platform and then dived into the reservoir. The water uh, was bitterly cold, uh, and sadly, he immediately got into difficulties. His friends attempted to rescue him, uh, but sadly, they were unable to do so, and he disappeared under the water. Uh, as we've heard, he was uh, a young man with his life ahead of him. He was a talented drama student, and he is obviously severely missed by his family uh, and friends. Now, United Utilities told the inquest into Mark's death that there were a number of signs around the edge of the reservoir warning of the danger of the water and pointing out that it was extremely cold and very deep in places. However, since the incident, the company has installed a number of throw lines around the reservoir, and this, uh, I'm afraid, Ms. Garney, is frequently the case. Throw lines tend to appear uh, after an incident such as this has occurred. And uh, Mrs. Bartley's view is that authorities responsible for the management of large bodies of water should be proactive in terms of the installation of throw lines rather than, uh, sadly, as they are at the moment, reactive. Um, there are around 260 accidental deaths from drowning in the United Kingdom each year. More if one takes into account the number of British citizens who die in drowning accidents uh, overseas. And Mrs. Bartley believes very firmly uh, that that number could be significantly reduced uh, if there were a requirement to provide throw lines at every large body of water in the country. Clearly, uh, everybody would agree it's highly desirable uh, that the number of deaths by drowning should be reduced and the provision of throw lines uh, would be a move in the right direction. Most uh, reservoirs are owned by the major water companies. Uh, the Environment Agency is responsible for the management of rivers 
and the Canals and Rivers Trust have responsibility for managing the canals around the country. All these entities have a responsibility for the safety of the bodies of water that they manage. The Royal Life Saving Society is one of the leading charities in this field and uh, it helps people enjoy being on, in and around water safely. And I would commend its website, which is a tremendously valuable resource. It provides a huge amount of information about water safety and gives a catalogue of the risks associated with open water, which include, as we've heard, the shock of cold water, uh, which can make swimming difficult even for the strongest swimmer and increase the difficulty of getting out of the water, the lack of safety equipment and increased difficulty for rescue, the depth of the water which frequently changes and is unpredictable, and strong currents that can sweep swimmers away. Evidence that was uh, given at the inquest indicated that the water in the reservoir was extremely cold. Uh, in fact, one of the witnesses said it was freezing. And no doubt the low temperature was at least a, contrib a contributory factor leading to the dif dif difficulties that Mark got into. The coroner at the inquest remarked that Mark's death was caused, as he put it, by the impetuosity of youth. And he said, we think we're bulletproof. We do what comes naturally to us and never think about the risks. It is possible that had throw lines been provided at the mm -hmm. reservoir, more could have been done by Mark's friends to avoid this dreadful tragedy. It's also probably true that if throw lines are more widely available on bodies of water across the country, there would be many fewer fatalities of this sort. Uh, in its uh, response to the petition, the government has pointed out that landowners have a responsibility to assess and act on the risks posed by open bodies of water on their land. And that's certainly true. Uh, and I would ask my honorable friend, the minister, in replying to this debate, the kind of, kinds of action that she believes that landowners should be taking in response to those risks uh, and whether she agrees that throw lines which cost about 250 pounds should be more widely available and perhaps she can indicate if the government is prepared to legislate as urged by Mrs Bartley will my honourable friend give way yes I will give way I thank my right honourable friend and constituency neighbour for giving way. He's making some excellent points today. Now, I've had 566 constituents sign this petition, a very significant number. And I'd ask my right honourable friend, does he agree that any guidance or legislation that comes forward further to this debate needs to apply to Wales as well as the rest of the United Kingdom? David Jones. Yes, I believe so. Uh, that there has, in fact, been uh, a debate on this issue, I believe, already in the Welsh uh, Senate in Cardiff. Uh, but uh, when one considers that the Health and Safety at Work Act is a, a national piece of legislation, I would very much hope uh, that my honourable friend will indicate what national legislation she has in mind, or at least what the government is prepared to do to provide stronger guidance to those who manage large bodies of water. And finally, uh, Ms. Ghani, I would like to commend the work of the Royal Life Saving Society. Uh, I've spoken to Mr. Lee Hurd of that organization, uh, and he's told me that the RLSS is always happy to assist landowners by advising what sensible precautions can be taken uh, to minimize the risks associated with bodies of open water on their land. Theirs is a hugely valuable resource, uh, and I would encourage all landowners to make use of it. I'm obliged. Thank you, Mr. David Jones. No doubt the Raw Life Saving Society, if that's correct, will be in Hansard twice because of your contribution today. Sarah Champion. Thank you, Ms. Gurney. It is a pleasure to serve under your chairing, as always. I'd also like to thank the Petitions Committee for selecting this topic and for my honourable neighbour uh, for leading on it. It, it's truly heartbreaking to hear about Mark, um, who lost his life at just 18. And can I give my thanks and condolences to his family and friends? But also, Leanne, thank you for setting this petition up so that others have a chance to speak and hopefully not go through the horror that you have. It's 
deeply upsetting and it makes me angry that had basic safety equipment been available, his life may have been saved. And what makes it even worse for me is that Mark's story isn't an isolated incident. According to the National Water Safety Forum in 2020, 242 accidental deaths took place in water. This debate provides a valuable opportunity to reflect upon all of those tragedies and what more might have been done to prevent them. In May 2021, my constituent, Sam Haycock, tragically drowned in a local reservoir. Sam was just 16 years old, a talented judo uh, competitor. He competed at European level and really had a promising future ahead of him. Throw lines were available at the reservoir and Sam's friends tried desperately to save his life. But having been padlocked to prevent vandalism, they were unable to access them in time. Procedures for accessing protected life-saving equipment should not hamper um, what is the difference of, of moments of seconds between life and death, but unfortunately they do. I want to paint you a picture. Just try to imagine that your friend is drowning you're panicking. You have to first locate the throw line. Then you have to call the emergency services to get an access code. Then you have to give them the access code. You have to remember the reference number that they give back to you, memorize the code and enter it. All the while, you can hear your friend crying for help. It's clear then that this is not just a case of providing the equipment but ensuring that it is easily locatable and easily accessible. We must also confront the very real reason why that throw line that might have saved Sam's life was behind a padlock. Mindless vandals who damage or steal life-saving equipment, that they are placing people's lives at risk, and we must ensure that the law acts as a sufficient deterrent. Since Sam's death, his parents, Sam and Gaynor, have been campaigning for Sam's law, which would do just that. I work with colleagues in the other place to table an amendment to the Police Crime and Sentencing and Courts Bill, which would create a specific offence of destroying or damaging life-saving equipment, including life belts, throw lines, life jackets and defibrillators. This amendment was debated at the committee stage and report stage, but regrettably was not pushed to a vote. Speaking for the government at report stage, Lord Wolfson argued that the amendment was not needed because endangering a life through intention or reckless damage to property is already an offence under the Criminal Damages Act. This may be the case, but it is clearly not enough and there needs to be more to prevent this sort of vandalism. There are several examples which show clearly that existing legislation is failing to provide sufficient protection for life-saving equipment. After life-saving equipment was damaged at Sulphur Keys, just days after being installed, Sulphur City Council was forced to resort to a public spaces protection order to deter vandalism. At Uckfield in Sussex, a defibrillator was rendered useless by vandals. Each act of vandalism on life-saving equipment could lead, ultimately, to a death, and the law needs to reflect this. Lord Wolfson did acknowledge that, and I quote, if the law is not enough of a deterrent, we must focus on those responsible for water safety, health and safety, and law enforcement to come together to find out what is not working and identify workable solutions that might include signposting or signposting more clearly on the equipment and the consequences of damaging that equipment. This is a welcome commitment, but with lives at stake, it's one that must have real urgency. I would therefore urge the Minister to bring forward a strategy that will ensure easy access to life-saving equipment, strengthen public information about water safety, and ensure that punishments for damaging or destroying that equipment recognises the devastating consequences to which this can lead. If we are to save lives, we need to take action now. We need provisions which require local authorities, private landlords, or whoever is responsible for a body of water, not just to provide and signpost life belts and throw lines, but also make sure that they are properly maintained. There must be more education for all about the dangers of open water swimming, particularly in schools. Sadly, many of those who die in open water are, young, are children and they must be taught about water safety from the earliest age. 
we can prevent other families suffering as Mark Allen and Sam Haycott's families have, but it will take urgent and consistent action from government to ensure that our legal framework, infrastructure and education are up to the task. Thank you. Mrs. Natalie, um, Mrs. Natalie Elphick. Thank you. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, Ms. Garney. I congratulate my honourable friend for his opening remarks and the Petitions Committee for this debate today and all those who have petitioned to bring this important matter to us. The tragic death of Mark Allen, it highlights the dangers associated with open water. I send my prayers and best wishes to Leanne, to Mark's family and friends and also to Sam's, um, and that was so very sadly and effectively brought to life by my honourable friend, Rotherham. Thank you. In this context, I would like to talk about the terribly sad death of my constituent, Lucas Dobson, from Deal. Lucas Dobson was only six years old when he fell into the River Stour in Sandwich and drowned. Like a lot of children, Lucas was excitedly enjoying a barbecue and a day out with his dad at a privately owned jetty. While his father was checking an engine nearby, Lucas tried to jump on the boat by himself. He missed his footing and he plunged into the water. He was instantly swept away by the strong tidal currents. He disappeared. And that disappearance lasted for four days. During that time, Thousands of community volunteers and police from my community searched high and low on the river for Lucas. He was tragically found dead on Wednesday, the 21st of August, 2019, some four days later. The inquest heard later that on that day, neither Lucas nor his friends were wearing life jackets while they played amid the boats on the jetty. And that's why I'm supporting Lucas's family, his mother, Kirsty First, grandmother, Donna Kentfield, and cousin, Zoe Aldous, in their calls for a new law. That's Lucas's law. And that strongly echoes and builds on Mark's law being discussed today. Lucas's law has three parts. It would make it compulsory for young children to wear life jackets on boats and around them. It would require more life-saving buoyancy rings and lifelines to be installed near rivers, lakes, and seas and start a new safety awareness campaign for parents of young children, including encouraging them to use float suits and swim vests when children are playing near water, particularly on hot days. It can only take a moment for an accident to happen that can take a young life. Children's float suits and swim vests can be inexpensive. They can cost as little as 10 pounds. Like cycle helmets and seat belts, it just makes sense to be water safe. Yet more people die from drowning each year than from cycling. So we really need to start doing something about this. I've been working alongside Lucas's family to raise awareness of this incredibly important issue. I've been calling on the Royal Yachting Association to back these life-saving plans, as well as other water safety organizations. The year that Lucas died, the RNLI helped about 40,000 people to safety in the water. I absolutely thank the RNLI and uh, Her Majesty's Coast Guard for all the work they do to help people safe in my constituency, which is a coastal one. But I am disappointed that organizations like the Royal Yachting Association and others, who should have water safety in their very DNA, are not backing calls for new safety laws around water and compulsory life jackets for young children. In particular, it is essential that these provisions extend to private boat owners and private jetty owners, that they take that legal responsibility and appropriate action for ensuring the safety of young people. Just as there have been changes in other areas like privately owned transport, the car, it is time for there to be action on privately owned boats and jetties. Many other countries, including America, Ireland, Australia and New Zealand, already have mandatory life jacket laws. It's far time for the UK to put in place these basic life-saving laws to protect young children near water. Like Mark Allen, who lost his life to drowning, Lucas Dobson might have been saved if the right safety processes were in place and had been followed. The tragedy in both these cases, and that of Sam, 
is that these are accidents which might have been avoided with better water safety support. So now we must do what's right to stop accidents from drowning, resulting in death. Representing, as I do, a coastal constituency, water safety is an extremely important issue for me and my constituents. I look forward with hope that in the next year we can see Lucas's law, Sam's law and Mark's law move forward together because it does feel as if there is a need for a comprehensive strategy in this place. I would like to end by paying tribute to Lucas's mother, his aunt and his grandmother in this tragedy. Since the death of their child, it's been tough years for them. I commend them for pulling together and campaigning for better water safety to ensure that no other families go through what they had to go through, and again to ensure that no further lives are lost in water unnecessarily. In a time when enhancing all aspects of public safety is seen as an important function of government, safety, especially of the young, around bodies of water must not be a poor relation in the safety debate. That this happens rarely is not a justification for inaction. There is a responsibility to tackle water safety with the rigour that befits an island and water nation. The challenge must be to stop avoidable deaths by drowning happening at all. To educate, to legislate and to save lives. Mm -hmm. Mr Damien Moore. Thank you, uh, Ms Garney. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, a pleasure to follow my honourable friend, the member for Dover. And I'd like to thank my honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, and the Petitions Committee for securing today's important debate. Uh, this petition was signed by 606 of my constituents in Southport. Um, I'm all too well aware of the tragic case of Mark Allen, and I send my condolences to his family and friends and join my colleagues in calling for throw lines to be installed to prevent this needless loss of life in the future. Landowners have a duty of care to those on their land. And by speaking here today, I want to suggest that this duty should be strengthened with further legal requirements and for landowners to assess and act on the risks posed by open bodies of water. I welcome that since the Health and Safety Act of Work Act 1974, the government has enforced legal requirements to prevent employees and other people from coming into harm during their work activities. But this act has well-known limitations and under it it is not possible to enforce simple solutions such as a duty to provide throw lines near all bodies of water. It is unacceptable in a modern 21st century country such as the United Kingdom that drowning continues to be one of the leading causes of accidental death. Indeed, it is estimated that a shocking 44% of drowning fatalities happened to people who had no intention of even entering the water. Drowning in the United Kingdom is reported to account for more accidental fatalities annually than fire deaths in the home or cycling deaths on the road, and we find that in every age group, men are the most at-risk group, accounting for 8 in 10 of all the deaths. This is simply... I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Thank you apologise for uh, coming in late for traffic, I'm afraid. Um, would you agree with me that, that, particularly for very small children, uh, the depth of the water can be oft, often very, very shallow, uh, and that, that sometimes, particularly in, say, caravan parks or things like that, areas that people think are actually safe for a very small child, they're not, and there have been some terrible... Uh, occurrences and deaths with, with children drowning in, in what is only, say, a foot or so of water. Um, I thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman. He makes uh, an important point, and I do think that's why the risk assessment around open bodies of water, particularly where children are concerned, is an incredibly important thing to do for those that own that land so that protection uh, like throw lines can be put into place. In Southport, the sea rarely comes in, but when it does, it is rapid and all too often deadly. Our local rescue services go above and beyond in their duty to warn and protect. And I welcome the opening last week of Southport's new £1.4 million lifeboat station. The Southport Offshore Rescue Trust is independent from the RNLI and was founded by Kath Wilson after her son passed away in 1987 on the Southport coast whilst fishing. Southport lifeboat is crewed entirely by volunteers and has helped the safe return of over 5,000 people since it was founded. Madam Chairman, I'm sure that we all want to wish Kath and her excellent team of volunteers congratulations for their amazing work here. I also want to highlight that, there are, that the RNL have some excellent videos and explainers about what to do if you're in trouble in the water, including dealing with cold water shock, and I would encourage all of my colleagues to share these with their constituents. 
For example, if there are three extremely important words provided by the RNLI that anybody today takes away from watching this debate, they are float to live. I'm also sure that many of my colleagues are aware of the tragic incident of Ben Smith Quallen, who tragically fell into a lake in Southport's Botanic Gardens and sadly died following complications from the infection afterwards. Following the Make a Change for Ben campaign led by my constituent David Rawsthorne, tens of thousands of pounds have been raised for improvement works to the gardens. These include an aeration fountain to the end of the lake to ensure water is oxygenised, as well as potentially, uh, potential measures to stop people falling in. But I also add throw lines to the list of safety measures that need to be included. The UK Drowning Prevention Strategy acknowledges the difficulty caused by the responsibility for managing water risks being dispersed amongst a number of organisations. While many of these, such as the Southport Offshore Rescue Trust and RNLI, do excellent work, further efforts should be made to unite their various responsibilities to ensure that resources are most effectively used, responsibility clear defined, and individuals best protected. But, Madam Chairman, let us start with the simple solutions. We should heed the calls of this petition to implement throw bags and throw lines around open bodies of water and then go further by expanding opportunities to learn how to swim and spreading awareness around water safety. When the UK Drowning Prevention Strategy was published in 2015, it called for accidental drowning fatalities in the United Kingdom to be halved by 2026. The latest data shows that we are halfway there, with a 25% decrease since the strategy was published. We should maintain this progress, even speed it up if we can, and ensure that we all do everything we can to prevent senseless tragedies such as that of Mark Allen from ever happening again. I would urge my honourable friend, the Minister, to do everything she can to help prevent these tragedies uh, from occurring in the future. Thank you, Ms Garney. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And indeed, I congratulate the Honourable Member for Don Valley and the Petitions Committee for this debate this afternoon. I've come along um, as a chairman of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Drowning Prevention. and We're ably served by the Royal Life Saving Society. And it is a great pleasure to be able to speak to some of the issues of concern that I have. But I'd first like to start, as many others have, by giving my condolences to Mark's family and indeed to all those people who have died as a result of drowning. As has already been said, drowning occurs in this country on about 400 occasions each year. So to put that into context, it's about one every 20 hours. So within the time period that we've been awake, there will be one person who have drowned. And that is something that we, we must simply stop. It's also been mentioned by my honourable friend for Stockport that this is a figure in excess of the number of people who die from fires in the home and indeed who die in cycle accidents. 400 people whose deaths are preventable. But we also know that many of those people who do not drown in accidents, who do not die as a result of drowning, end up in a persistent vegetative state. And we do not have the numbers of the number of people who then go on to need care for the rest of their lifetime. So the drowning isn't all about the number of people who die. It's about the accident as a whole and the impact not only on the NHS, but also the emotional and indeed, on occasions, economic welfare of our family, of our constituents. But the second reason I came along today is that uh, I've been interested in water safety for many years. I am, I suppose, a qualified lifeguard. I was a lifeguard for many years um, in two pools that I can remember and indeed on five beaches in Cornwall when I grew up. So I have not only my bronze medallion that I can uh, go into the water with a reel and line, but also with a paddleboard and my torpedo tube. And in fact, some of us remember our former colleague, Charlotte Leslie, who's someone I worked with when I was on the beach at Bude. And so the whole issue of water is very important. But in addition to that, I am a very active sailor in this country. Um, I like to scuba dive and, su and, and surf. I also see kayak and, kayo, uh, and, and canoe and have a paddleboard. And so I think you get the impression, Ms Garney, that I'm either on, in or under the water on many occasions. But it's not at these times that we see problems with people uh, drowning or even having problems in the water. As has been said, most people who actually drown end up in the water without expecting to. They could be running along a canal path, for example. They could simply trip after a night out. Or they can be pushed in by someone as a simple prank. And that has happened on many occasions. 
But the popularity of activities such as wild swimming, something else which I do, and paddleboarding is leading to more and more people having problems in the water. Now with paddleboarding, the problem has been people being pushed out to sea. So we do see in parts of the United Kingdom problems facing that. And the throw line initiative wouldn't help with that. But with wild swimming, it certainly would. And we need to identify places where people regularly swim. The whole issue of wild swimming and deep water quality is one that's very much on the mind of the government following the Environmental Audit Select Committee. I'll give it a small plug on our rivers uh, and the quality of our, our rivers, which is very important. But uh, I mentioned about people actually going into the water. I was quite saddened two weeks ago, I was walking in Covent Garden, and in Waterstones there was a, of course other bookshops are available, but I was in Waterstones and there was a poster, um, and it was about a missing person called Harvey Parker. And two days later I was watching the London News, and it said Harvey's body had been found in the Thames. And Harvey, who was not a constituent of mine, had been to the Heaven nightclub, and I presume he'd been drinking, and he found, on one occasion, he was simply in the water, once again, not realising that he was going to end up in the water. And Mr. the same Alfred, as that case... may, Can I just comment that that may be an open case? We mustn't reflect too much on I, that situation. I certainly situation. wouldn't. I, I take your advice. I certainly Thank wouldn't. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, but there's also the case of James Clark, who the same thing happened. He was at a nightclub in Kingston-upon-Thames, and he... He was not amongst his friends when they all left. And when they got home, they realised he wasn't there. And it was the next day they realised that James had gone missing. And a few days later, his body was again found in the Thames. Both these occasions, these guys did nothing wrong. They'd been drinking, but that's not a crime in itself. But in the end, they found themselves in the water and sadly expired. And that's why I welcome the RNLI's initiative. Um, the RNLI station here at Westminster in the embankment is the busiest station in, in the United Kingdom. We find that hard to believe that an inland water body is actually the most busiest. But the RNLI have actually worked with organisations including Nicholson's, the pub partnership, and, and they are now supplying throw lines to other pubs, including the Horniman at Hayes, just down by HMS Belfast. And some of the bouncers on the door there say that they feel more empowered that when people leave, they often have had been drinking, and they will quite likely either hang around or stay near the railings, and sometimes even decide to stand over the railings uh, if it's a warm evening. And on those occasions, people have been known to fall in. And so the, the bouncers feel that it's a, a great initiative to have a, a piece of equipment that they're able to use to actually save and help some of these people. But it's been mentioned the Health and Safety at Work Act. That is very true that it's a piece of legislation that is necessary for in, in companies and employers who are responsible for um, waterways. But most of our waterways in the United Kingdom are actually used by recreational users. And so they're not covered by the World uh, uh, Health and Safety Act. So I particularly would like to see um, throw lines installed in greater parts of the United Kingdom, across we've already heard in Wales as well as Scotland and Northern Ireland as well as England. But the National Water Safety Forum, in its drowning prevention strategy, has come up with a, a target to half the number of uh, drownings by 50% by 2026. I'd certainly like to see that target be more ambitious, but most of all, I think it could play a valuable contribution to preventing untimely deaths. When anyone goes into the water, it becomes as quite a shock, but that shock is nothing compared to the friends and relatives of the person who no longer comes home at night. Thank you for that very serious contribution, although you did also give us a kaleidoscope of all your water activities and all the time you have for that as well. Um, <laughs> Ms Kirsty Blackman, are you ready? I am, yes. Good. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much for um, chairing this meeting this afternoon. And thank you to the member for Don Valley and the Petitions Committee for ensuring that this is brought to debate. It's incredibly important that we do debate this, and it's, it's very timely. My, thoughts are the family um, of, of Mark Allen and I applaud your bravery and tenacity in taking this forward and in bringing this this year today hopefully some change can be brought about in order to ensure that other families don't go through um, what, what you have. Um, in Scotland we've got a pretty specific um, situation around uh, open bodies of water. We have lots of open bodies of water, and the open bodies of water that we have are very, very cold. Um, we've seen during the course of the pandemic 
as was mentioned, an increase in the number of people wild swimming, an increase in those paddleboarding, an increase in um, canoeing. I can't claim to do any of those. I've tried sea kayaking and I am never going again. I was so seasick. It was ridiculous, which I didn't expect to get sea kayaking, but um, it's not a thing that I will carry on with. Um, that, that increase in these people going out and enjoying the water and um, having a good time in, in the water in Scotland is brilliant. This is a great thing. But we need to ensure that we increase the amount of education that happens as well um, at the same time. We need to ensure that people, when they are going into the water, are doing so understanding the risks and understanding what they need to do um, should the situation occur that they get into difficulty. Um, uh, the RNLI's campaign, um, Float to Live, was mentioned, and I think that's incredibly important. You know, it doesn't matter how strong a swimmer you are. It doesn't matter how many times you've been in that water before. Hitting that water and getting that shock of the cold water can, can, can mean that you can freeze up and, you know, be unable to, um, to float to rescue yourself um, and, and get into real amounts of difficulty. So I think it's really important that we make sure that as many people as possible are aware of that. In Scotland, um, we had res our res own response to the drowning prevention strategy um, in 2018 including a number of things, but one of the key um, measures in it was to promote and develop water safety education and initiatives within primary and secondary schools. Um, given that we've got a different education system and given that we've got a different police and fire system um, in Scotland, it, there, there does need to be, a, as well as the massive number of bits of water that we've got, there does need to be a unique strategy and we are taking that forward um, in Scotland as an attempt to try and make a difference. Um, it is the case, though, that in July last year particularly, we saw a really big issue. We saw um, a doubling in the numbers of fatalities in Scotland's waters. Um, and as a result of that, um, particularly around Loch Lomond, there has been a massive increase in the amount of safety equipment that has been put in place. A number of organisations, including the Council, have worked together to increase the number of throw lines, to increase the number of um, safety signs, and to increase the, um, the presence from the, the lifeguard boat um, at that side of the loch to ensure that people can um, be saved should they get into difficulty. Um, it shouldn't be the case that this only happens after the fact. It shouldn't be the case that this, um, it takes those fatalities for us to realise. But the, mo the more that we can do to increase the amount of education that there is, the more that we can do to increase the amount of safety equipment and to ensure that people know how to use that safety equipment as well and to ensure that it's kept up to date and looked after all of those things are incredibly important and we will hopefully get to that point by 2026 where we see that number um, of people drowning in open water reduced. We all want to get there, we're all pushing in, in that direction but we need to see particularly I think um, the education in schools and just, just lastly, um, whenever I go, I've got young children, my children are 10 and 8, whenever I go to um, a harbour as you quite often do in, in Aberdeenshire, whenever I go to the side of uh, water, I am terrified that somebody, either my children or somebody else's children, are going to fall into that water. It's something that I'm absolutely hyper aware of. Um, my children probably don't realise how hyper aware of this I am. And when they hit you know, 14, 15 and they're going out by themselves, they won't have that same level of um, terror about the water as I do about them being near the water. So I as a parent and everybody else in all the schools need to make sure that young people are educated, that they have got that reasonable awareness. You know, it's okay to go into the water, that's fine, but you need to have the awareness of the danger that that can pose so that um, we see fewer fatalities, so that we see the number as reduced and so that people can enjoy the outdoors safely um, in Scotland, England or Wales. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. It's, um, it's, um, you Chair, a particular pleasure to see you here today. Um, could I also um, start by congratulating the member for Don Valley on behalf of the Petitions Committee. I was a member of the Petitions Committee myself in the past and I know how important these debates are and I thought he introduced the whole subject with a, with a gravity and a comprehensiveness that did justice to a very serious set of issues and dealt particularly with, with the, the pain that I think um, has been represented in, in all the speeches um, from honourable members today. But most of all, um, could um, I express uh, my admiration for the campaigning that Mark Allen's mother has, has done, Leanne. Uh, when I was researching this issue, I was very struck by the, the impact that that campaigning has had in terms of garnering support, a magnificent number on the petition, not just here, but in Wales as well. Um, but also, uh, I hope that all of that will lead to change, and that is the purpose for which we're here today. We heard very powerful speeches, Ms. Garney, from around the chamber. 
And I guess what struck me um, with all of them was every single one uh, was reflecting tragedies for families and constituents. And, and the roll call of names is really very, very sad indeed. I was struck by the um, comments from the member for, for Cluid West um, and who represented, I think, his constituent very, very effectively. I thought his point from the coroner's report was quite striking. We all think we're bulletproof, don't we? I suspect we can all look back on occasions in our own lives when we've done things which on reflection probably weren't wise. And mostly you get away with it, but occasionally you don't. And that, that is the key to trying to find a way to make our fellow citizens' lives safer. I was also very struck by the comments from my honourable friend, the member for Rotherham. It seems almost indescribable, doesn't it, that people could be vandalising safety equipment. It's the world we live in, unfortunately. I thought she made very strong points about the need um, for action on that. Uh, the sad accounts by the um, Honourable Member for Dover, Lucas's um, situation, again, a strong series of points, which I hope the Minister will listen to closely. Um, the Honourable Member of Southport, Ben, on it goes, it seems, doesn't it? And I think important points about the RNLI and the member for Hendon, who is, at least can come to our rescue as a lifeguard, um, which, is, which is a very positive contribution um, as well. I was also struck, Ms Garney, by um, the fact, of course, this is not the first time this issue has been debated in this place, looking back to the debate, I think, back last July, possibly, which was slightly more education-focused, but again, more sad cases being recounted then, and the same points being well made, I think, that... Um, it's not just about swimming. It really isn't just about swimming. It is much more about understanding and awareness of the dangers and the need um, for that message to be uh, effectively um, put forward in schools. And one of the questions I would ask the Minister is um, what outcomes there have been from that discussion then. I think it was raised by one of the members in the debate. Um, what, what impact has that had uh, on the Education Department and what have they been doing to try and make sure that uh, I know the curriculum is crowded, but these very important issues are raised because the numbers are very striking. Uh, those numbers of deaths, uh, I've been a, well, numbers have been involved in transport over the years, um, and of course we work hard to improve cycling safety and road safety, but to have so many people dying from drowning each year, I think rather makes the point that we need to do more about it. Um, I contacted my water company in my area, um, Anglia Water. I was grateful to them for the guidance they gave me on what is quite a complicated subject in terms of the advice um, from the National Water Safety Forum, from the Visitor Safety Group, and on when and how to use public rescue equipment. But whilst I'm grateful to them, I also couldn't help noticing over the weekend the amount they've been paying out in dividends to shareholders over the last few years. And it does seem to me there, is, there are resources that could be made available, I would say by a number of the water companies to help us um, with this exercise in public education. And one further point I'd like to put to the Minister in terms of a question, echoing an earlier question, which I think came from the uh, Honourable Member of Cluid West, about what um, advice the government does expect landowners um, to be taking, and what they expect them to be doing. And I would just ask the Minister in conclusion, um, what assessment has the, has the government made of the effectiveness of this panoply of measures that are there supposedly to ensure safety, what assessment has been made and what conclusions have they drawn from that? I would also ask uh, to outline what actions have been taken following the petitions debate last year, as I said earlier. I also noticed in reading this that there was, did appear to be a slight delay in responding to the petitions committee. I remember in my time we had many complaints about government replies, um, but not always delays, and I just wonder why that was. And reading the response, I have to say it seemed to me to be an account of the current layout. I'm not sure it quite amounts to a response, and I would be grateful if the, if the Minister in return could um, produce a response rather than just an account of the current landscape. Final conclusion, Ms Garney, can I say that that roll call, Mark, Sam, Lucas, Ben, so many others, we need to make some progress on this, and I hope the Minister can give us some assurance. Thank you so much, Mr. Zeichner. I call the Minister, Ms. Kemi Badenoch. Thank you, Ms. Garney, and it is a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. And I would like to thank my honourable friend, the member for Don Valley, for securing this important debate today. 
And I would like to start by offering not just my condolences, but condolences on behalf of the whole government to Leanne Bartley, who is here with us today, that there is nothing more horrific than losing a child. It's something that we all pray we never, uh, that we never see. And I really want to pay tribute to her and for her tireless campaigning uh, since her son's tragic death in 2018. It is impossible not to be moved by this tragedy. Uh, to learn that Mark Allen drowned after jumping into a freezing reservoir on a hot day, that there were no throw lines in sight. It's absolutely heartbreaking to hear. And also to hear similar stories of uh, Sam, Lucas, and so many of our young constituents. Um, and it's also heartbreaking to learn that a similar tragedy apparently also took place the same year at another reservoir uh, not a mile away. Uh, Dwayne Thompson, I'm told, aged just 20, drowned after encountering similar freezing temperatures at Audenshaw Reservoir. So there's clearly a problem that needs, that needs looking at. Um, so Leanne Bartley, um, Amanda and Stephen Thompson, uh, I remember the member for Dover mentioned one of her parents. I remember her first name was Kirsty. Uh, I'm sure Hansard will fill in the surname. They've all shown tremendous courage, channeling their grief and using a platform uh, that no parent should ever wish to have to press for for change. And the fact that Mrs. Bartley's petition has garnered over 100,000 signatures, is being debated before the House today, is testament that her efforts have not been in vain. Uh, United Utilities, who own both reservoirs, have installed new throw lines at both sites, has been discussed. And these throw lines may one day be the difference between life and death for somebody else in the future. However, I acknowledge the point made by my honourable friend for Don Valley that uh, these things seem to occur, and other members have made this point only after the tragedy. And I was quite struck by the point he made that um, it isn't just about having this equipment, but because what screams safe to us actually screams unsafe to, uh, to the safety professionals. I know that uh, the company itself is now running hard-hitting campaigns targeted at teenagers to warn of the dangers of swimming uh, in reservoirs, as well as collaborating with the fire service to highlight the risks using TV print and online media. So I thought I'd answer a few of the questions that were uh, asked in the debate and then just go on to talk about what we are doing to protect people uh, and ensure that they're able to enjoy the waterway safely. Um, many members asked about what the government was doing uh, on this issue. And I want to assure members that we are committed to protecting people in the weeks and months ahead. So one of the things that was interesting to me picking this issue up was that this is not an issue within one department. So I'm responding today uh, from, from a local government perspective, but as others have mentioned, DFE is involved, uh, the, ca uh, the cabinet office in terms of convening, DEFRA has a role for some waterways, uh, councils do, and even the DWP because it runs the health and safety executive. And you often find that when there are many departments that are looking at something, it's never that uh, straightforward to get to get a, a coordinated response, which is why we tend to answer uh, questions specifically on the particular issue that falls within our remit. Um, but the Cabinet Office is currently reviewing coastal water safety, and we'll explore more what can be done with all our partners across central and local government to raise awareness of water safety and increase the provision of throw lines and other vital life-saving equipment near open bodies of water. Um, members asked about what can landowners do. I think providing them with information is clearly something that's required. So it means ensuring that businesses, landowners and councils are conducting up-to-date and thorough risk assessments. That, that's the first thing. We know that the local, the local government association's water safety toolkit is an invaluable resource for councils in those cases where the local authority has a role. And I'm committed uh, to working more closely with the LGA on ensuring it's being properly publicised and used by local authorities across the country. People need to know, um, they need to know about the safety and, and we need to do more to publicize. Uh, many members asked about mandatory legislation. That's, that's not where we would start from. It may be that that's the answer, it may not be. I think we need to look at various issues first. Uh, the member for Rotherham raised uh, an important point about throw lines actually being present, but not usable. So there's there, there, a lot of work needs to be done to to discover what the right way of resolving these issues are. And um, the member for Dover raised issues about compulsory life jackets and better education. Those wouldn't fall within the remit of my department, but I know that officials will have taken, will have taken that away. 
Um, and uh, we also heard from the member for Vale of Clwyd and Aberdeen North. I think this is clearly something that, despite my department covering England, we need to make sure that we've got a whole country uh, coverage and we work together with devolved administrations for a, um, for a comprehensive view. And I look forward to working with colleagues uh, across the House on this issue. Uh, so in terms of what, uh, what is available at the moment, we know that there are 40,000 lakes, and no matter where you are in the UK, you're never further than 70 miles off the coast. Between 2019 and 2020, searches for wild swimming increased by 94%. So the pandemic itself has actually increased the number of people who are swimming wildly. There are many health benefits to it. We don't want to discourage people from wild swimming. Uh, cold water immersion boosts the immune system, it reduces inflammation, and uh, so many other benefits. But we need to make sure that people understand the risks of it, especially as more people carry out this activity. And while it is the case that we've enjoyed uh, very hot weather recently in the past few years, our waterways all remain cold. Uh, you know, they remain northern European, even if the weather is becoming Mediterranean. And that's one of the reasons why ensuring that people understand the risks are just as real as the benefits of wild swimming. So the tragic deaths of Mark, Duane, and the other young people we've mentioned should have been unique um, accidents, but they weren't. In 2020 alone, I think the member for Clwyd uh, stated there were 254 accidental drownings and 631 total water-related fatalities in the UK. And combined with uh, you know, this surging interest in wild swimming and the tragic loss of life, highlights and reinforces the responsibility of the landowners wherever they may be, whether they're local or private, to properly assess uh, the safety requirements of water on their land. And our number one priority as a government is to keep people safe. And we expect landowners to uh, act in the same way. Yes, of course. Um, firstly, I, I want to thank the Minister because she was clearly listening very intently to uh, my speech and, and all of this debate. Um, but, but thinking about her specific um, department, one of the things that um, contributed to the death of Sam was the equipment was overgrown. Um, and most of these places uh, where you put the throw lines are in areas of dense vegetation. So it, it's sort of a two-part question, thinking about local authorities and how it would both assess and uh, make sure maintenance happens of other sort of life-saving equipments in dangerous situations. We've identified open bodies of water are a dangerous situation. So um, is there a situation where the government could put forward, you know, for however many cubic metres of front there has to be so many throw lines, but also make sure that the local authorities actually go in and make sure that the regular checks are being done. So in my case, it was the vegetation being cut down. In others, it may well be just, you know, in bright sunlight, the equipment deteriorates, so that when it's needed, if you can access it, it, it actually fit the purpose. Minister Bay, do not. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think that's a really good point. It's exactly the kind of thing that I would expect the local government association's water safety toolkit to have. And if it doesn't, um, it's probably worth us mentioning this to them when next, uh, when next we meet. So I will ask officials to, to take that away. I think it's a good point. Um, I was going to talk about the, the 30 different navigation authorities managing regular, regulated inland waterways. I won't. I'll just mention two, the Environment Agency and the Canal River Trust, uh, which some of you might have heard of. The, the Canal and River Trust is a charity. It owns about 2,000 miles of inland waterways. The Environment Agency is the arm's length body of DEFRA that manages 630 miles of waterways. And both those bodies uh, are responsible for ensuring that waters are safe and both have to undertake public safety assessments to work out where on the waterways public rescue equipment like throw lines should be. So there is some work um, that is done. And they, they know waterways back to front. They know the best places to install throw lines, the busiest locations where there have been in, in particular previous safety incidences, incidents, pardon me, or places uh, that we know are higher risk like water side pubs. And we do know that these organisations run proactive public, sa public safety campaigns to raise awareness of the risks. Um, but the, uh, it's clear that we need to keep redoubling efforts to make waterways as safe as possible for those bodies of water that aren't covered by the charities and the arm's length bodies. Uh, so those are the unregulated inland waterways. And the responsibility for providing water safety equipment rests with them, 
But in the case of uh, larger urban areas, it is with local authorities. And we know that local authorities tend to work with the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents, the Royal Life Saving Society, the National Water Safety Forum, which have been mentioned today. And those groups do a great job in highlighting the risks with campaigns that warn people on the dangers of getting into cold water, which can lead to panic, inhalation of water, and in serious cases, uh, cardiac arrest. Uh, but we all know that the best rules and the best guidance are redundant if people don't know how to swim to begin with. And my, my honourable friend, uh, the member for Don Valley, is right to draw attention to the critical role of education in all this, as did uh, actually the member for Cambridge and Southport. And I'd like to speak a bit on what, is, what people are being educated on. It goes without saying that swimming is a truly vital life skill, and that's why swimming and water safety form compulsory parts of the PE curriculum at key stages one and two. And as part of the curriculum, people, pupils are taught to swim at least 25 metres competently and confidently using a range of strokes effectively and perform safe self-rescue. And as part of our efforts to help children catch up from lost learning and lost activity as a consequence of the pandemic, DfE did organise for school, school sports facilities at 101 schools to reopen their pools or extend their swimming offer last academic year. And DfE is also working closely with Sim Swim England, the Royal Life Saving Society UK and Oak National Academy to support pupils returning safely to swimming and promoting water safety education. I know DfE ministers are very keen that I mentioned these points so that people would know what they're they are doing. And while education has an important role to play, uh, and the bodies I've mentioned continue to undertake proper risk assessments and put safety mitigations in place, there are other practical steps that we individually should keep in mind when we want to enjoy our waterways, and I would like to just state them on the record uh, as a reminder. And Mrs Bartley, as part of her campaigning, has really pressed home the importance of actually talking to children about cold water shock and the dangers of open water. And she's absolutely right when she stressed that it takes a whole different set of skills to be able to swim in open waters than it does to swim in a swimming pool. So what we're doing in schools is critical, it's not, um, but it's not all that needs to be done. So the National Water Safety Forum also advises swimmers to wear wetsuits and allow their body to acclimatise to the change in temperature instead of jumping straight in. And another essential factor people should consider before they go swimming in open water is the location, because the safest places to swim are always going to be supervised beaches with lifeguards and outdoor, um, and outdoor pools. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution also recommends that people check the weather forecast and see conditions before a swim when on the coast so they can avoid the potential danger of getting caught in a strong current. Um, and as my honourable friend, the member for Hendon, spoke very, very eloquently and with much expertise on these issues, far more than me, um, safety in water is not just about safety equipment, it's also a bit about understanding and being aware of the danger. United Utilities, who own the reg reservoir where this tragedy occurred, have now made sure their signs make clear the risks to life. And on their website, they have set out guides for parents, highlighting in particular how cold shock can affect even proficient swimmers. So the advice of the RNLI is, if in doubt, don't go out. And, yes, yes, of course. I wonder um, if either she's able to comment or could pass it to her colleagues in education. Um, I, when I was at school, uh, we had swimming lessons. Uh, I hated it, and it worked because I never go near water again, so it kept me safe. Um, but I went to um, a, a local authority school. Um, I know that many of the local authority pools have now been shut down, and I know that many schools are now academies. So, so is it um, sort of a, a compulsory or a recommended thing within education that children, particularly primary school children, still have swimming lessons? And if not, is it something that she could raise with her colleagues, please? Yes, it is part of that uh, key stage curriculum, but I think what I will do is get DfE ministers to write more comprehensively uh, to her on this issue. I wouldn't want to say something that was inaccurate because um, it, it wasn't within my portfolio. And I just wanted to conclude by saying that we all shared the same... Yes, yes, of course. ...to her forgiving way before she concludes. Um, as I understand it from her remarks, the government is not yet persuaded that legislation is the appropriate answer to the problem that we're debating today, and she wishes to carry out further assessments. Uh, can she say when she anticipates those assessments will be complete? And whilst I appreciate the point she, she's making about education and understanding the risks of the water, which are obviously correct, can I remind her what the coroner said? It was the impetuosity of youth. We all think that we're bulletproof. And frankly, had there been a throw line there that day, it might well be the case that Mark Allen would be alive today. 
would she give serious consideration to legislation? Uh, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his intervention. We will give serious consideration to all the, all the options. We need to make sure that this is absolutely the right pathway uh, to go down. I understand the point that everyone has made. I do not want to be standing here for another debate where another child or young person has, has lost their life. So I want him to know that this is an issue that we take very seriously. And he has been in government uh, before. He knows that it's never, it's never a matter of making, making a statement in Westminster Hall. There are all sorts of people who need to be consulted and we need to work out in fact, which department would actually start looking, looking at this issue. But I have committed that we will uh, come back with a response, and I think that that is something that we should be able to do in a reasonable, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so to conclude, I just wanted to reiterate that we all share the same ambition of making our waterways as safe as possible. There is more that can be done to educate people on the risks, but I know that the bodies charged with keeping people safe take that responsibility seriously and will be upping the ante in the months ahead to prevent deaths like Mark's in the future. And uh, I want to take this opportunity on behalf of the government to urge every landowner, every council and every agency and charity involved in our waterways to find new and engaging ways in the months ahead to teach people about how to enjoy the water safely and we are here to support them uh, in whatever way we can. And finally, I want to thank again Mark's mother, Leanne Bartley, for bringing this petition forward and inviting us to debate this important issue today. We're very grateful. Thank you. Mr. Nick Fletcher to wind up. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure to serve under your chairship today. And I'd like to thank the Minister for what was a comprehensive uh, answer uh, to this debate. I'd also like to take this opportunity to, to thank uh, Mark Munleyan for coming here today and for bringing this petition forward. Um, I hope you uh, are pleased that it's been a, a thorough debate and I would like to thank all members who have actually uh, come along and taken part in this. It's obviously a real big issue because uh, every death is a death that shouldn't happen and we should do all as we can as parliamentarians to try and stop this from happening. I do want to just go back to the education piece, whether that is educating the, the young people or whether that's educating landowners um, through risk assessments and local authorities. I also think we should really take our time as parliamentarians to listen to the professionals and really listen to their advice on that. Sometimes I think we, want, we like to do things, we like a quick fix to these things and really we should be taking what the professionals say. So if they say equipment should be put there, then it should be put there. But if they say no, it may cause a further problem Problem, then we should look at that. Just quickly going on to um, what the Honourable Member from Rotherham said about actual maintenance of these. Uh, within the risk assessment, the, uh, the risk assessment should um, state frequency of inspection. And um, I think one thing that we can all do as parliamentarians is look when most of these accidents happen, uh, and there's an awful lot of these accidents happen within the summer months when we're coming to, so prior to bank holidays, prior to summer, I think all of us as parliamentarians can use our social media to get good positive messages out there um, to, to, let, to let parents know, to maybe just um, uh, remind the uh, teachers who are dealing with children with water that if they are teaching them to swim, yeah, this is a fantastic safe place, it's warm, you've got lifeguards, but out there it's a different, it's a different world. And so I really think it's a massive education piece um, and I think we should all do what we can to try and keep all, uh, all young, people, young people safe. And, and as I say, with the statistics being 80, I think the last one I looked at was 82% of the accidents last year that happened. On the, the figures that I've got from the library, there's different, there's natural water and other water. Which, so we've, uh, we need to be careful which ones we're um, quoting. But it was 82% of the accidents were, were men. So everybody needs educating the same. But I think sometimes when I was a young man, I didn't listen. It's like the Honourable Member said, we think we're bulletproof, and I know I did. So we really need to get this message over because uh, it's tragic and no one should, uh, should have to go through that. But once again, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming to this debate today. Thank you. Yeah. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 575967 relating to throw line stations around open bodies of water. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order.